Hello, Mesa Church. Really great to be back with you all. Um, had a pretty good week. I hope you did too. Yeah? Good. Excellent. Two people had a really good week, so that's great. Um, a couple of things I want to just say, just some housekeeping items as we get started this morning, and uh, then we're going to get into our text, Nehemiah chapter 5 today, is where we're going to be studying. Uh, first, um, I want to encourage you to continue to pray. Uh, hopefully in your bulletins this morning, all of you received a prayer plan, and it's a wonderful framework that Dave and several other team members contributed to, to put together and a lot of love and a lot of prayer went into this prayer plan. <laughs> so please avail yourself to that. You know, prayer was the love language of Jesus, right? You know, we see so many times that he just went to be by himself to talk to the Father. and He prayed in the garden. He even prayed on the cross. And so prayer was very, very much a part of the rhythms of his spiritual life. So if it's important to our Savior, I have a hunch it should be important to us. Amen. So... Let's commit to be people of prayer. And boy, two weeks from today, every Sunday special, but two weeks from today is just going to be an amazing experience for this church as your entire worship assembly is going to be devoted to prayer. And I am I'm thrilled that you're going to be able to experience that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be out of town, but I'm going to be watching it remotely uh, that Sunday morning. I'm going to be tuning in and so I can be a part of that experience with you. And I know that's going to be a very, very special day. Uh, your search team, your, your prayer chair, your elders, lots and lots of people contributing to make that a very special time. Speaking of your search team and your elders, just want to make a few comments. Spent uh, two and a half hours with your search team yesterday. I got to tell you, they are knocking it out of the park, okay? They're doing great work. And it's a labor of love for our Lord and for you, and they're doing it with incredible enthusiasm. I was able to meet with the elders this morning, and I got to tell you what a very, a truly, I mean this with all my heart, a, 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 a very special group of men. And they love the Lord, and they love His Word, and they love you. Uh, they are not perfect. Did you know that? Did you know your elders are not perfect? Did you? You got that? Uh, but I don't know anybody in this room that is. Anybody here want to claim perfection? Uh, if so, you and I need to talk afterward, okay? So uh, we need to have a conversation. But they're good men to their core, to their hearts, and so I'm thankful that they're here and doing what they're doing. And uh, they want to work with you. You know there are elderships out there who don't want to work with their churches, right? That is true. And there are churches that don't want to work with our elders. You know that's out there too, right? So uh, we don't want to be that kind of church. And uh, thankfully, um, I'm not seeing that here, so praise God for that. Uh, Jackie's going to say something in a little bit about the survey response, but it was off the charts. Thank you, thank you, thank you for participating. Lots and lots of information to pour over and good stuff. Okay, that's all of our housekeeping stuff. Let's uh, get into the text this morning. I want to start with a question. How many of you grew up poor? All right. I can relate. Okay. Uh, I did not grow up with uh, money. My family didn't have money. My dad was a butcher, and he worked as a butcher for 40 years. He could cut up a chicken faster than any man I've ever seen in my life. Okay. Slice, 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 dice, chop, boom, it's done. Um, but we didn't have a lot of money. We had a lot of love, a whole lot of love. So we were rich in other ways, but just not that particular form of currency, okay? So I know what it's like to not have and not have a lot of stuff. And based on the number of you who raised your hands, you can relate to that as well. Several years ago, I was introduced to Dave Ramsey. You may recognize that name. Okay. If you don't know who Dave Ramsey is, I would encourage you to uh, Google his name. Uh, I'm not a fan of everything that he puts out, but I will say that his principles for managing wealth are sound, and they're biblically sound as well, I think. 
And so my wife and I started practicing the principles of uh, Dave Ramsey even in our 20s, and it's made a huge impact in our lives. It's really been um, something that's kind of changed how we handle money, how we view money, uh, how we view using money to bless others and be about uh, work for the Lord. Um, But there's a couple of observations that he makes, and I just want to draw your attention to this. Uh, A couple of observations observations that he makes on his website as to um, why people stay in debt. Why do we stay in debt? One of the first things that he mentions is that we love to keep up appearances. He talks about this phenomenon called keeping up with the Joneses. Have you ever heard that phrase? Keeping up with the Joneses. Actually, this was kind of birthed in our nation. It's been around for a long time. You can even look in Scripture and see how people compare their wealth to the wealth of others and how they want more, you know, greater than what others have. But in our culture in particular, um, keeping up with the Joneses was really a phenomenon that kind of was, was birthed when the boomers, the boomer generation, really began to grow and, and accumulating lots of things. Um, and so this is what he says, though. He says, uh, little do you know the Joneses, keeping up with the Joneses, little do you know that the Joneses have a leased BMW, an underwater mortgage, and an unwelcome visitor named Sally Mae living in their basement. Okay? Uh, the Joneses are the most broke people in your neighborhood. And that sometimes can be true. And he also says that people are unwilling to sacrifice. How could you possibly give up eating out three nights a week? Or what would your life look like without cable? These are some of the questions that he asks. So do you really want to be out of debt? Well, if so, you're going to make some modifications on how you spend your money. And he actually does this thing on his radio show where he asks people, how many times are you stopping at Starbucks a week? How many $5 lattes are you buying a week? Well, not that many. I just get one a day, you know, right? Cumulatively, that adds up over time, right? Uh, He also notes that people just have no hope. And when you get buried under thousands of dollars in debt, sometimes you just feel like there's no way out. And we have young men and women now who are graduating from college with seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 and more in student loans. And it's like, what do you want to do with your life? And I don't really know sometimes. So it creates a problem, right? Kind of a sense of urgency of what's going to happen. And sometimes people just kind of throw in the towel, maybe bankruptcy or... Moving to Canada or, you know, whatever, whatever happens. He also says people just don't know how. They don't know how to get out of debt. They have good intentions. They want to kick debt to the curb, but they don't know how to do it. Um, but this is what he says, and I, I think this is fascinating, and now you're going to understand why I'm setting this up the way that I am. He makes an observation. They have been in debt so long that getting out from under $50,000 in credit card bills seems impossible, but it isn't. His words, all you need, are you ready? All you need is a plan. All you need is a plan. Now, we talked the last several Sundays about doing what with a plan? Obviously, the sermons have been really impactful the last several weeks. <laughs> we are going to make a plan, and we are going to work the plan. Make a plan, work the plan. That is at the heart of his methodology. And if you think about it, it's at the heart of how most of us live our lives. Not all, but most. Whether it's raising our children whether it's growing our faith, whether it's building a house, growing a business, whatever it is, kind of pick your, pick your trajectory. Successful people will typically make a plan and work the plan. Obviously, Dave Ramsey, is, he's speaking about pain that is caused from financial debt. And we'll talk a little bit about that today from Nehemiah 5. But there is something that's missing from his list, and that is... Sometimes you are in a situation where you are taken advantage of. Anybody ever been in a situation like that? Where someone took advantage of you financially, 
speaking. I remember when I was young and the very first time I ever bought a car, wow, did I get taken advantage of. Okay, I really, really did, but I'll never forget that. Now, when I talk to car dealers, I take the initiative <laughs> when I'm buying. And I say to the salesperson, here are the rules. <laughs> this is how this is going to play out. And that just came with life, right? And with experience. But even in that kind of thing, I make a plan before I get there. And then when I get there, I work the plan. More about that here in just a bit. As Christians, we should care about how people are taken advantage of. And I'm not just talking about money. Because I believe we have people all over the United States right now, all over the world, who are being, being taken advantage of emotionally, mentally, physically, and worse, although not everyone has conscious awareness of this, spiritually. Satan is the great manipulator. He has everything into overdrive right now, it seems. And we have got to be more attuned spiritually as people of God than we have, we have ever been, at least as far as this culture is concerned. Two weeks ago, we asked the question, what do I do when the walls of my life collapse? We looked at Nehemiah's response to working with people who were rebuilding the torn down walls of Jerusalem. Last Sunday, we modified that question a little bit. And we asked, what do I do as the body of Christ? What do we do when the walls of someone else's life collapse? So we've identified several uh, themes that we've focused in on for the past several Sundays. We talked about being people who are prayerful and being people who are full of purpose and, and being people who uh, enable one another to action, to equip one another to action, to live out our faith. We talked about making a plan and working the plan. And Nehemiah did all of these things. And, and quite a bit more. And not only did he do these things, but he did these things in the face of great opposition. When it came to their mission, the people are bought in. The work continues. The wall reaches half its height, we read in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. These are a people who are prayed up. They are purposeful. Everybody is contributing. They've made a plan. They're working the plan. And all the while, evil just kind of bides its time. As we're going to see in our text today, in every situation known to mankind, I cannot think of an exception. There are those who take advantage of others. So what do we do? Well, let's take a look. Nehemiah chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we have to get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. And still others were saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's taxes on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood, as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we must subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we're powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Now, in previous chapters, we discover that there were those who do not want the wall rebuilt. And these enemies of Judah, they use lies and uh, deception and threats and manipulation to derail God's purposes to restore, through Nehemiah's leadership, the walls that surround Jerusalem. However, we are introduced to a new enemy in the story in chapter 5. And this enemy is poverty. And there are two particular reasons in this context why it happens. First, Judah is cut off from its neighbors due to surrounding hostility, okay? So they can't trade like they used to be able to. That creates a problem. If you've got product and you can't sell it, that's a major issue, right? Second, rebuilding and defending the walls, it involves a lot of time and a lot of energy, and a lot of cost. We talked a little bit last Sunday about this cost 
that the people are having to pay. Remember this from chapter 4, verse 21. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn until the stars came out. And so in addition to working on the wall, they're also having to defend the wall. Verse 22, we read, At that time I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workers by day. So if the men are having to stay in Jerusalem and these are shepherds, these are farmers, these are vineyard owners, then who's taking care of the farm? Who's managing the flocks? Who's tending the vineyards? Well, nobody. And so if you're a farmer and you can't farm, what do we got? We got a problem, right? So ironically, the farmers aren't angry with Nehemiah. They're like, spot on, Nehemiah, let's get this wall rebuilt. They're all in. They're bought, all, they're bought in. They're going all out. But they're not pleased with their Jewish brothers. And boy, they don't hold it back either. They're quite expressive because their wealthy brothers are using this dilemma to get more wealth. Are you with me so far? People of God are taking advantage of other people of God. Nehemiah 5, 6, when I heard their outcry and their charges, I was very angry. Now, this is really interesting. So the outcry of the people here, they're, they're crying out to Nehemiah, they're crying out to the Lord. It is the exact same Hebrew language as when in Exodus they left Egypt. It's what they're experiencing in our hearts. Pharaoh is bearing down on them just prior to the Red Sea crossing. And in Exodus 14, we read, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them and they were terrified and they, here's the same language, they cried out to the Lord. So think about their mental state here. Think about their heart state. It's the exact same place where they are in Nehemiah. It's a super, super serious situation. And if it's not righted pretty quickly, it could actually cost them their uh, freedom, and it actually could compromise the entire community of faith. And I think it helps us understand Nehemiah's response. When I heard this, man, I was really upset. I was really, really angry. So why is he angry with his Jewish brothers who are using their wealth to personal benefit? In verse 7, we notice that the nobles have made loans and they're charging interest on their brothers and sisters who are sacrificially giving their time and their resources to help rebuild the wall. I want you to see this in the text, Nehemiah 5, 7. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and the officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. And so I called together a large meeting to deal with them. So I want you to notice Nehemiah's response here. This issue is so serious the Hebrew indicates that he actually files a lawsuit against these officials. They are accused, not accused in a court of law, uh, not accused as someone who stands before a judge, but they're accused in the presence of a great assembly. Those who are suffering under the leadership, yeah, quote unquote, air quotes, leadership of these nobles and officials. Because the interest charges are starting to pile up, and it's causing some serious issues. The debt on the farmer's mortgages, coupled with their loans to pay their tax bills to the Persian Empire, it's starting to get so great, the interest is starting to get so high, that the people are at the end of their rope. These debt-ridden people are suffering. You see that in the text? But it's not just financial suffering. Because I want you to think about this. This just kind of blows my mind. They're building a wall that will ultimately protect the people who are taking advantage of them. Things have gotten so bad that they are placing their children into debt slavery, hoping that one day 
they will be able to purchase back their own. Their children are having to work for others, to be enslaved to others, just so they can eat. That's how bad it is. Basically, they are pawning their sons and daughters. I want you to notice in verse 8, I told the nobles and officials, as far as possible, we've bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. The nobles kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. If we quickly read through the text without taking time to process it, I I think we miss a really sad reality that seems to plague the people of God over and over and over and over again, and that is in a time when God's people should come together They turn on each other. And I don't know about you, but I've seen that in my lifetime several times. And sadly, I see it even again today in many situations. Nehemiah doesn't stand for the injustice that's occurring here. Um, he, uh, He reacts quite strongly. The story continues, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? So he points the finger at them. But then there's this really interesting twist. In his own leadership testimony, he points the finger at himself. And he talks about how he uses his own wealth Um, as a means to a righteous end. And here's what he says. I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us, all of us, stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves and houses, and also the interest you are charging them. One percent of the money, new wine, olive oil. We'll give it back, they said. And boy, wouldn't it be awesome if leadership was that easy. Hey, people, change your minds. Okay, we're all in. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. We'll give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. And then I summoned the priest and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, amen. And they praised the Lord and the people did as they had promised. Moreover, from the 20th year, of King Artaxerxes when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the early governors, those preceding me, they placed a heavy burden on the people. They took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to the food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I didn't act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work of this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We didn't acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. Every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all of this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. So Nehemiah, it's really a a statement of generosity. We could look at this and we could go, well, he's kind of bragging, isn't he, (laughs) about what he did. It's not bragging. It's a testimony because he's not really talking so much about what he did. He's talking much more about what what God is doing through him. And he models here a really powerful truth that I think we would do well to own in our hearts as a church. And it's this. We are not free to do with our wealth as we please. We're not free to do with our wealth as we please, but we are compelled to do with our wealth as God pleases. And I I just pray we would remember that. Nehemiah 5, 19, and I, I, I just love this verse. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. Now, I just want you to look at that verse for just a moment. I I wish I knew the tone. Wouldn't it be awesome if all the words in Scripture would have been tape recorded? Wouldn't that be so cool? 
so we could actually hear the tone in the speaker's voice. Um, is Nehemiah, is, is he sighing here? Oh, remember me, oh Lord, for all I've done for these people. Is that how it comes across? Uh, is, is, he, is, he, is he weary? Is there a tiredness? Is, 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 this the, is it a prayer? Lord, for all that's been poured out on behalf of these people, Father, please, please don't, don't forget me. Don't forget me. Is there a humility in these words? I don't, I don't really know. But I think based on what we know about his character, and I think what we know about his belief in the mission of God, it, it seems to me that this is a prayer for continuing strength, for continuing resolve. As the inevitable occurs, and what is inevitable more obstacles. <laughs> Has anybody in this room got it totally figured out? Anybody? Because how does life work? You overcome one thing, and what happens? It's not long before the next challenge arises, right? It's not long before the next trial comes. It's not too long before the next thing happens that we wrestle with and that we struggle with. But I think this just so shows us how plugged into God we must be as people of prayer and people of his word to sustain us through those difficult times. Otherwise, we'll just abandon it. We'll just give up. So with this text as a backdrop, I just want to think out loud for a little bit this morning, uh, process a few questions together. Uh, First, what parallels do we find? when we reflect on the opportunities that we have to move forward as a church family? And second, how do we safeguard turning on one another as we work together for the purposes of God? So let's look a little bit with those who are oppressed. As we think about this passage, most of us cannot relate to the depths of despair that these people are experiencing. And a lot of us have been in very, very difficult circumstances But I don't know of anybody, at least in my space, who uh, have had to sell their children in debt service, okay, to somebody else. I don't even, I can't even begin to get my head around that. Maybe some of the images we saw this past week of mothers passing their children to soldiers might give us some inkling of what people are experiencing here in Nehemiah 5. Um, But I, I quite frankly, struggle to relate to the amount of trauma that they are experiencing. Some of you have experienced great trauma in your life. You may have a much better picture of that. But I do think all of us know what it's like to be taken advantage of, right? We all can relate to that, at least on some level. Um, But our relatability may be a little bit limited. We have the oppressors here, those who are taking advantage of their brothers and sisters in, in the Lord And we may think, well, boy, I sure am glad I'm not like those oppressors. Um, Can you even imagine taking advantage of somebody when they're they're already down and we're just going to take even more advantage of them? And and sadly, it it might be easier to adopt these same attitudes than you might think. I was reading through several articles when processing this passage, and I came across a message that was delivered by an anonymous preacher. He he asked some pretty tough questions about this text. Um, Here's some of the questions that he asked. He said, Have you ever been on a sports team uh, or had children on a sports team where the coach's child is always the starter while others ride the bench? Please don't shout out names, by the way, okay? Uh, Have you ever known someone who found out their car had a serious mechanical problem and then rush to the nearest dealership to trade it in, hoping that the service department wouldn't find out. Ooh. Have you ever been in a situation in your child's school where the child of a parent with a great deal of influence always gets the reading, leading role in the school play? Have you ever known someone who tells lies at work, maybe to make a sale or maybe to get a promotion or to get a job that perhaps someone else deserves more than them. Have you ever known someone who used private knowledge they had about a friend 
to damage the reputation of that friend and the eyes of others to their own benefit. And lastly, he asks, have you ever known someone who uses their influence over the leadership of the church to keep things going just the way they like, even if it means it's not best for the church or for the community? Ouch, 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 ouch. Kind of feel like a human pincushion after I read through that, right? So whether we've witnessed it or worse, done it, (laughs) I think we can relate to the what's in it for me attitude that we see in this passage. However, there's another attitude that's also on display, and that's the attitude of a great man of faith. His name's Nehemiah, and I want to contemplate just for a bit how we might imitate, or better yet, uh, own the type of attitude uh, in our own faith and in our own faith practice. Nehemiah was a wealthy man uh, spiritually. He was a wealthy man by worldly standards, but he refuses to use his wealth to take advantage or manipulate others. He will not go there. He uses his wealth to bless others. Uh, Nehemiah's leadership actually reveals that wealth isn't the issue. It's not intrinsically right or wrong to be wealthy. Wealth's just, it's just one means of being able to bless other people. But it is a problem if we use it to take advantage of other people. I think it's fascinating here when we look at this passage that Nehemiah has every right to get a food allowance from the people. It's part of his right because of his position. He can get a food allowance. But he, he refuses it because it puts a burden on others. And so we see another truth here that's worthy of imitation. Nehemiah doesn't just talk about being a follower of God. He acts like a follower of God. And I think his primary motivation for the prayer, I think this is it. When he prays in verse 19, God, remember all the good that I have I've done for these people, these, these partners that I've been with on mission for you, God. Please remember me. So at the beginning of our lesson, I shared some themes that we've covered so far in Nehemiah, themes that are foundational for rebuilding that which lies in ruins. I shared some reasons from Dave Ramsey's perspective on why people get in debt. I mentioned there's something missing from his list, however, and that is being in situations where others are taken advantage of again and again by people who care nothing about the impact. As long as they make a buck, who cares how it impacts the little guy, right? I noted that as Christians, we should care, and hopefully we do. And if we can do something about it, we should. And if you're willing to go there as a church, we will. Not just financially, but spiritually and emotionally as well. And this is the beginning of a framework to do just that. So church, your elders have committed to an interim plan, and they are inviting you to work the plan. As we work the plan, the doors will open to a greater plan that will emerge over the next few months as we co-labor in this place. I believe a new vision will be birthed for this church as a result of our time together. A vision that honors God, blesses your community, that engages more and more of you in ministry. And I'm I'm excited about the possibilities and I hope and pray that you are as well. So the question before us today is, what's the interim plan? There are four primary pieces and I want this to become just part of our working vocabulary over the next several Sundays in our Nehemiah series and beyond. The first phase is inquiry. That's the phase that we are in right now. This is part one of the plan. We are asking questions of you. And almost 300 of you gave us feedback. Praise God. And I want you to know we are reading every single word. Every word. 
and we're incorporating that into a report that we will generate and ultimately give back to you as a church. This is what we heard you say, okay? We are also inquiring of other people in our community. We're talking to civic leaders. We're talking to school leaders. We're talking to other nonprofit leaders to try to find out where and how we as a body of Christ can minister in this community and how we can minister in this community uh, and beyond effectively. We're inquiring also of other churches to see what they're doing, what ministry bases they're covering, and seeing if there are ministry bases that are uncovered, a unique space that God may have in mind for this church to fill. So we are asking lots and lots and lots of questions. We are also inquiring of the Lord, and that's why we're asking you to pray, pray, pray. We want to hear His voice in this season of inquiry. In the next few weeks, we will begin a new season. It is a season of identification. And we will take what we've learned in this season of inquiry, and we will begin to identify the type of preaching minister candidate, the types of tools that he will have in his toolbox, the way that he approaches preaching, the way that he approaches leadership, the way that he approaches interacting and working with elders and deacons and other ministry leaders. We'll identify the characteristics of that individual. That will then move us into the third part of the plan, which is the interview phase, the interview part of the plan, where we will begin having conversations with potential candidates and ultimately, to the calling of the Lord, invite um, one or more of those candidates to this finalist phase to be considered as the next preaching minister of the Mesa Church of Christ. With your say, obviously, as part of that equation. And we'll talk a lot more about that a few weeks from now. So here's our template. This is our plan. And we're inviting you to continue to work that plan. We'll have a lot more to say about each of these phases as we get deeper into them. Right now, we just need to help you continue to pray us to the finish line through this phase of inquiry as we plan to move more into the phase of identification. And by the way, I think if you look at all of these phases and you look at the book of Nehemiah, it's amazing how beautifully <laughs> these themes lay out on the story of Nehemiah. Um, so a question for you as we wrap up today. What heart and head uh, attitude should we strive for as we work through these stages? What should be the, the posture of our hearts? What should be the posture uh, of our minds. I want to share an example with you of what I think that posture needs to look like. Um, I am a, uh, I'm a fan of stories that go viral on the internet. Not all stories that go viral, but some stories that go viral. And a couple years ago, there was a fascinating story that went viral of a woman who drove through Starbucks and came back the next day with an apology note and a $50 tip after she snapped at a barista the day before. And it's a little bit difficult to see the note and to read it, so I just want to share what this note says. You can kind of follow along. Greetings, Starbucks barista. Yesterday at your drive through we had a less than cheerful encounter. At no fault of yours, you were out of carriers and said you could not take my empty cup, my trash. I was less than understanding, and my manner was curt. I need to apologize. The thought of leaving a trail of unkindness like that is not the path I want to reflect. Not for you, not for me. You are a young man, clearly working hard to build a fortune, and you should be commended. Keep your attitude of cheer and hope. Stay hopeful no matter what kind of people cross your path or drive through. Surely God has good blessings in store. You taught this old lady something yesterday about kindness, compassion, and staying humble. I thank you. God bless you today and all your todays, Debbie. 
Now, here's what I'm not suggesting. I'm not suggesting that we start leaving large sums of money at drive throughs okay? That's not what I'm suggesting. However, I am suggesting that we learn from someone else's unfortunate expertise, which is a great line, by the way. I'm an unfortunate expert <laughs> in fill in the blank. I want us to be a people who leave a trail of kindness wherever we go. Along the way, I have a hunch that some of us will be taken advantage of. As a matter of fact, I think that's probably a guarantee. We may try to bless someone in ministry, and they may ultimately do something nefarious with those funds to hurt themselves or to hurt somebody else. We don't have control over that. However, might there be others occasionally who respond to that trail of kindness and want to know the source? I'm going to tell you questions that are solid gold. Why are you being so nice to me? Why, why would you say that? I don't, I don't think I'm very lovable. What, why are you caring? What is your angle? What are, you, what are you trying to get out of this? Those are, those, those are questions that are solid gold. Let me tell you why. Because that's when you can give a solid gold answer. There's only one, there's only one thing that makes me respond the way that I respond. And that's the love of Jesus Christ. Or there's only one reason that I, I'm doing these things. And it's because of who I am in Jesus Christ. Or there's only one thing that gets me through a tough time like the time you're going through. And that's my relationship with Jesus Christ. Church, God still opens the door for conversations about Jesus. He gives us that opportunity to be people. We may not be able to bless with large sums of, of money, but there's a different type of currency out there that is ours for the taking and it's ours for the giving. If we just walk through these open doors that Christ Jesus gives us. Last week, I asked you to prayerfully consider one conversation opportunity. And I hope God opened that door for you, that you were able to bless someone with a, a conversation, just a simple conversation about your faith. And uh, I want to continue to issue that challenge again and again and again, to look for those open doors that we can walk through. And bless people, all kinds of people, but particularly those who Satan has just taken advantage of again and again and again. And show them a very, very different path. I so appreciate you listening uh, this morning. Uh, thank you for being in the Word with me. I'm looking forward to being with you next week. We've got a couple of more lessons in Nehemiah. And then we'll move on to a new series and be telling you more about that here in the next couple of weeks. We're going to share a song together. If there's anything on your heart you want to share with the church this morning, a couple of our shepherds will be down front. And uh, so if it's a, a, a question about baptism or setting up a Bible study or prayer for you for health or spiritual well-being, whatever it might be, then uh, let's, let's just stand together. Let's just sing together, respond if you need to.